Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon. Finally, I'm at TED. I have 15 minutes to tell you how awesome I am. Um, usually when I'm interviewed for television or newspapers or um, if thesis students interview me for um, their dissertations, they ask me about my art, my struggle as an artist, and um, uh, my inspirations. But what most of these interviews miss is the details about my personal life. My personal life and my art is so closely connected that it would be, um, it seems pretty artificial and incomplete to me to um, talk just about my art and not my uh, personal life. I was born in Jeddah on the 7th of June 1990. I like to mention my date of birth a lot because I share it with Prince Damien Hurst and Liam Neeson. So that's pretty cool, I think. Um, I was born after seven girls and um, so being the youngest in my family and being the only brother of seven sisters, I had a very um, pampered and um, a spoiled start to my life. When I was two years old, my family moved to Saudi Arabia, uh, sorry, back to Pakistan, to Karachi. And, um, oh, and in a few years, in a matter of few years, my father lost his job, my, they, we lost all of our property in Pakistan, everything was going downhill. And um, a few years later, when I was eight years old, my mother passed away. So, that sparked the artist in me because as I didn't have any brother, so I didn't have any mutual interests with my sisters. So all I did was either I would, you know, draw or I would spend my time outside the house. Then what happened in 2001 was an amazing thing happened for me. It was life-changing. I got introduced to hip-hop and I started listening to people like Dr. Dre, Wu-Tang Clan, Junior Mafia, B.I.G., all these guys. And a lot of these guys were talking about rejection from society, um, being turned down, um, rejected for being different and being unique, and living with a single parent, living with no parents, trying to get a job and all that. So. I could relate to a lot that they were talking about. Between 2001 and 2005, I got introduced to all elements of hip-hop, rapping, DJing, beatboxing, b-boying, and graffiti art. And as soon as I passed school in 2005, I also got introduced to parkour. But what happened in 2004 in grade nine was that um, I was a biology major, I was a 100% scholarship student, and you know how in Pakistan, uh, seniors try to uh, scare you, okay, board exams are coming, you'll be, you know, they'll destroy you, and invigilators are very crazy, etc. So even though I was a position holder and I worked really hard uh, and studied hard for my exams, the, there were some students in my class who had bribed the board. They got A plus and I got a C grade. So I decided not to continue uh, studying this hard, and I uh, passed school with average grades. I sp decided to study privately for college. And when I was in college in 2006, 2007, till 2008, um, there were a lot of problems going on in my home, and um, my father's health was depleting. And again, in the second year of my bachelor's, I um, my marks were manipulated, so I dropped out of college, and I focused entirely on, it was like an escape for me, my art and b-boying and everything. I had not uh, decided to pursue it as a career yet, but I was constantly just focusing on um, learning these art forms. Then, um, from 2010, I started getting noticed. Uh, Facebook wasn't really uh, that, um, Popular then, we had Orchard, so I used to share videos on Orchard and used to share my work and everything. And I started getting small commissions, but at the same time, uh, my 
friends were getting jobs and my family was asking me, they didn't stop me from doing what I was doing, but they asked me if I, you know, how am I going to support a family? I didn't have a, I don't have a brother, so they were like, hey, once we are all married, how are you going to support yourself, etc. And then um, I, in a few years, I worked for different call centers and did some small jobs, but I, I felt miserable wherever I went because every time I was in the office, I was constantly thinking about my art, and I didn't have much uh, back then, but I had this passion to, you know, I, I felt like there was something in me that could bring a change. And my friends told me, okay, you'll never get married, you'll never be successful, and um, you're doing graffiti art, artists don't get any, you know, recognition here or any money. And by 2011, I was getting some work here and there, and I decided to join an art school. So from January 2012, I joined the Department of Visual Studies at Karachi University as a fine art major. Um, two months later, my father passed away. And it was really shocking for me uh, because my father was also my mother and we were very close. And um, he was um, a very learned man. My father used to work for the Interior Ministry of Saudi Arabia. He spoke 19 languages. And I, I grew up around books, around, you know, computers and everything. We had first generation IBM computers and everything. But so my, I couldn't inherit a lot of money from my father, but what I inherited was education and, you know, perspective and a lot of knowledge. So after his death, a few months later, I found out that the reason why my mother passed away and we lost what we had and then my father passed away was because some of our relatives had practiced black magic on them. And so that was the reason why they passed away. And it was really hard for me living with that. Um, the worst part is I also found out who did it. And it was, you know, juggling all these things, my art, my art wasn't going really well. I didn't have a, you know, a permanent income and everything. Then I had to support my family and then this. So that I developed, uh, because of that I developed schizophrenia. I, um, became very reclusive. I started drawing and painting and doing everything, uh, dancing obsessively. And after it discontinued for about a year, then in 2013, I had a very bad nervous breakdown and it lasted for about um, two weeks. And after that, I realized that a lot had changed how I look at things and I, I had this hunger to know more and, you know, see more and I exposed myself to uh, more things. And with some research, I found out that I had been through a spiritual awakening. So back then, when I used to, as since childhood, I was listening to these rappers. Now I started listening to Mozart and Beethoven. I started um, reading people like Rene Descartes, um, Nietzsche, um, Rene Guénon, all these guys, books like uh, The Prince, Kaiba Lion, and the secret teachings of all ages, all, the, all those things. And it just washed all my pain and everything, and it just expanded. I, I felt like I could see more, and there was more space in me now to, you know, take, take it all in. And um, I'd like to show you uh, some of my works. Okay, I'm supposed to stand here. That I've done. Some of my most major works and in the past few years. And initially at the rehearsal, the briefest I could come up with slides was 81. And now I have like eight, I think. So, because I, I did this in 2011. There's a, a tea hotel right next to this car, and I have been going there since I was in school. And one day I looked at these windows, and I was like, if I add a smiley below these windows, then it would make a face. So that's how it came. This was in 2011. It was shown at the Saatchi Gallery in London. Um, thank you. This is, I'm a big fan of Iqbal and um, uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah. And most of the sticker art that I do is revolves around uh, Allah Iqbal and uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah because I've been, my father taught me about them when I was little and I was just inspired by their works. So this is 
sometimes you just want to put on your headphones and ignore the world. This is, this is how I feel about it. Um, so how graffiti spread around the world was that artists in New York, they started painting uh, graffiti in subways and they started painting trains. So when they'll tag a uh, train or do a whole piece like this one, the train would go around the city or out of the city and then they, that's how uh, graffiti spread all around the world, especially in the USA. So this is a 7C bus, this is uh, in buffer zone. This bus, when I went to paint it in January 2014, it was supposed to be um, repainted two months later. It's been two years, it's still there. The driver decided not to repaint it. And, um, I, I did this on the 14th of August. This was a live graffiti demonstration. This is where, I'm, where the photographer is standing. They have the Hadri market on their back. Uh, this was commissioned by the town municipal, and this, uh, now it's been demolished because they have this uh, green bus project going on. Um, in 2015, April 2015, I became the first Pakistani artist in the world to be featured with Banksy and LC Faith 47, a long list of graffiti legends. This book by Nicholas Gans, it talks about the history of graffiti writing and graffiti art. It has about 85 artists from around the world. I, I'm the first Pakistani to be in it. Nicholas Gans, thank you. Um, Nicholas Gans previously wrote one of the most famous books on graffiti art. It's called Graffiti World, um, Street Art from Five Continents. Um, for the past four years, I've been doing live graffiti at the Karachi uh, University's annual carnival for free, just for the people to see, because there are um, the students from all around Karachi visit this carnival. It's open to everyone. They have a footfall of about five to 6,000 people every day. This is one of those walls I did in, um, last year. Okay. Um, this is uh, commissioned by a TV channel back in, in last September. And this, was, this is half of the wall. I painted a 45 feet mural and this is half of it. It, it said King Sanki. This was a 40 minutes freestyle. Um, I've had my first solo show this year in June. And it was at the Sanat Initiative Gallery in Karachi. And it's the, uh, what am I going to say? Yes, it's the most successful show by any artist in Pakistan in 2016. My show was sold out 10 days before the opening. And so these are the slides. But what I want to talk about is that um, the reason why I shared my story with you and what I had been through, and like back in the days, I couldn't afford to, you know, buy a, 100 rupees pencil or a 300 rupees sketchbook. And now I have, like, I have a full working studio. I have one of the most valuable art studios in Pakistan. And um, I, what I want you to get from my uh, story is that no matter what happened and the things that I've been through, I used all of it as a fuel to, you know, burn that fire inside me. I, I, I could have used all that misery, all that pain, all my loss to, you know, gain sympathy from people. After my father de father's death, there was a time that for about six months, I didn't meet my closest friends, and I just avoided human contact as much as I could. I didn't talk to my sisters. I would be just locked in my room. I would sleep all day stay all night and just you know, kill myself thinking about like the mistakes that I had made, the losses that I've, um, you know, been through my parents' death and I couldn't complete my education and my work was, you know, a lot of those things. And I was just locked in that room, um, like Charles Bukowski once said, that darkness was like sunlight to me. But when I got out of it and I looked at my work from a distance, I realized I, my context had never been better. My, my popularity was more better than before. I was uh, doing very well, but all, these, all this toxicity, all these toxic emotions were, you know, they had 
kept me pinned down. So what I did was, I had this, suddenly after six months, I had this intense realization that my time here is limited and I'm not gonna live forever. So what I did, I started meeting as many people as I could. I started attending as many events as I could. I just, you know, opened myself to life and said, come at me, bro, you know? And because I, I thought to myself, I had lost my parents, I, I fell in love with someone, uh, she cheated on me, I, a, lo a lot of crazy things happened. And I was like, what's the worst that society can do to me now? I, I've been broke, I've been hungry, I've been poor, what, what can someone or a group of people can do to me now that would hurt me? Nothing. So my message to you is, uh, I'm one of those people who are used to, um, used to this phrase, you are God gifted. And I, I think all of us are God gifted. And it's just that I unlock my gifts consciously or unconsciously earlier than the other, uh, other people. And I, I, just, I want you to write this down. There is no one more you than you right now. There was no you before you, and there will be no after you. So that makes you automatically special. You are the only one of your kind. <laughs> and how I got here in, in a window of five, six years, I didn't win a lottery, I didn't, I didn't marry a rich guy's daughter, I, I didn't inherit a fortune. You know what I did? I did the work that was needed to be done. I read all the books that I needed to read, I re listened to all the music that I needed to listen to, to calm myself down. I made the contacts that I needed to make because I t told myself either I'm going to die in that room in the dark or I'm going to go out there and follow my dreams, reach my goals. And this is w what my message to you is. If ev all of us have dreams, if you have dreams, it's always the right time to do the right thing. Follow your dreams now. I, I won't say 10 or 20, but in the next 100 years, everyone in this room will be dead, including me. Whether or not you believe in God, or whether or not it doesn't matter if you believe in any religion, we'll all be dead. So this life is precious. Follow your dreams, reach your goals, and don't do it for anyone. At least do it for yourself, because those dreams are out there waiting for you to, waiting for you to turn them into reality. God bless you all. Thank you very much for your time.